for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's July 2021, and this is episode 245, which is a conversation about the recent novel, The Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy, who has an MDiv, and she is also the author of Nailed It, 365 Readings for Angry or Worn Out People, and blogs about current events and theological trends at Preventing Grace on Pathios.com. Anne has written an in-depth online exclusive summary critique book review called Glimpsing the Grave, a critical review of the Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd. And as one of their benefits, our subscribers can read her article for free online at our website, equip.org. If you would like to read her book review and would like to subscribe to the Christian Research Journal, please also do that at equip.org. And it's good to have you on. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned, we're talking today about a new novel from the author Sue Monk Kidd. And this author is, you know, supposed to fall into the historical fiction category, and it's about the life of Jesus. So tell us a little bit about this author. She is very popular. She has had a few best-selling books. And what is this particular novel that we're going to talk about today, which is called The Book of Longings? What is it about? Well, I am not in the way of reading popular fiction usually, so I had actually not heard of Sue Monk Kid. Except I had heard of The Secret Life of Bees, which I think was a big seller. And so some of the other books that she's written, she's written The Mermaid Chair, and she's a big deal on Oprah's book club, I guess. But she got her start in sort of spiritual writing. She wrote for guideposts, and then she, in sort of a contemplative Christianity way of being. And she got big into feminist theology. So she wrote some spiritual books, When Love Waits, Spiritual Direction for Life's Sacred Questions, and then The Dance of the Dissident Daughter, A Woman's Journey from Christian Tradition to the Sacred Feminine. So I thought that was interesting because that comes up, the idea of the sacred feminine is a big deal in the Book of Longings. So this book, the Book of Longings, is about Anna, the wife of Jesus. And it's set in the first century. And it's a very fanciful idea that Jesus met someone and got married. And of course, he does in the book die on the cross But the book is not really about him. It's about Anna and her path, her journey to find and express her longings. And she does not die on the cross. She dies as an old woman in Egypt. The book starts out in Galilee and she travels all over the known world and eventually dies happy and old in Egypt. So it's a fun book. Uh, very, very fast going, but also it's meant to provoke, I think, and shock everyone by the idea that Jesus could have had a wife and that her name could have been Anna. So why did Sue Monk Kidd decide to write this book about the wife of Jesus? And just because it's had some media coverage, we decided to cover it because, like you said, it's one of these, you know, page turners is how it's been characterized. And so I can see, you know, women thinking, oh, this would be you know, historical fiction would be great for the beach to read on while I'm on vacation. Right. It is supposed to be a page turner. And I got through it by listening to it really fast. I <laughs> upped the speed and it made it feel even more breezy and exciting to listen to it fast. So she said that she had this idea in her head for a long time. 
she didn't want to do the regular idea of Jesus. She decided that, she, I mean, she for a long time thought, well, what did, there's thought some people have ideas that Jesus must have been married, basically, because no man who was religious would have been unmarried at that time in that place in the world. And she claims that the Bible is silent on the matter. And so he must have had a wife and something must have happened to her. So that sort of percolated in her mind for a long time. And then one day she had this idea that this woman would be called Anna. And the other thing that she really knew as she began to write the book is that Jesus was not going to be God. He was going to be fully human. And that was a more interesting literary choice for her because then you could sort of follow through what that would have been like to have a fully and completely only human Jesus who's not divine at all, but who also has some kind of longing of his own to bring about the kingdom of God. And so she did a lot of research and you can tell that the research comes through. She does know there's a lot of historical detail that would have basically been sort of true, except that, of course, those two things, Jesus was fully human, but was also fully God or is rather, and wasn't married. The scripture would have told us if he was married and he dies as an unmarried single man at the age of 33. So anyway, it was an interesting literary choice. And I think if you're trying to write an exciting book, I, I think it's fair to do that. And the book isn't interesting because it has Jesus as a character so much as who Anna is and what she's longing for, basically. So these kinds of fiction books have been popular in the past. I can't believe it's been almost 20 years since the Da Vinci Code came out. It was like 18 years ago. And part of that is, you know, supposedly Jesus and Mary Magdalene have this child, you know. And so this idea of kind of an alternate or just thinking through, imagining certain things like Jesus being married, what is he like in the book? I know you said that she just said that she focuses on his wife, Anna, in this novel, but how does she portray Jesus? I thought that Jesus on his own was an interesting character because he is the type of man that I'm running into more and more in regular 21st century life. And that's a very, very modern, very respectful of women, very desiring for women to be fully actually actualized in their personhood. Kind of a woke, I'm, I guess, I don't know if I should use that word, but he's definitely a feminist, Jesus, in the Book of Longings. And he's like, well, he's very good looking, of course, and very sensitive, very kind, very non-threatening, very accommodating. And I, I loved it. At one point in the book, he apologizes to Anna for not helping her actualize herself and find her own longings and for putting himself first, which I thought was a wonderful moment. So yeah, he's very modern. He's very... I don't know if the word beta male is used anymore, but I feel like he's the kind of person that would wear a really correct suit and not ever get married, <laughs> if that's too generalizing. <laughs> it's interesting that he has enough guts to get married in the Book of Longings, but he does. He falls in love with Anna, and they do get married. So I want to ask you a little bit about the title of the novel, you know, it's called the Book of Longings. So what does she mean by that? Is that the longings of Jesus' wife, Anna, or Jesus himself, or both of them? And do they get what they're longing for? So, yes, yeah, the Book of Longings. Anna has a deep longing. That's the driving motivation through the book. That's what drives the action is her longing. And the thing that she longs for is herself. She wants to know herself and be herself. And that's really the goal that she has. In fact, if you wanted to sort of, I think, understand what this longing is, I would go back to Glennon Doyle Melton's Untamed and look at how she describes how she goes into her 
closet and sinks down into herself. And as she sinks into herself, she discovers liquid gold. I think that that's probably a very good description of what Anna is always trying to find in the book. So her aunt in the early parts of the book gives her an incantation bowl and she makes an image of herself in the bottom of the bowl and writes a prayer inside it. And inside the bowl, at one point they call it her Holy of Holies. Whatever's inside of her in, that she can inscribe in the bowl, that's going to be her Holy of Holies. So it's herself, essentially. And she prays. As the book goes on, she sort of becomes a devotee of Sophia. But that's really insofar as she is looking for herself. And so the prayer she writes in the bowl is, Lord, our God, hear my prayer, the prayer of my heart. Bless the largeness inside of me, no matter how I fear it. Bless my reed pens and my inks. Bless the words that I write. May they be beautiful in my sight, in your sight, sorry. May they be visible to eyes not yet born. When I am dust, sing these words over my bones. She was a voice. So she is longing for herself. And that drives the action through the book. And it doesn't really get deeper than that, actually. This is episode 245 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy. She's written a critical review of the Book of Longings by Suma Kidd. Her review is called Glimpsing the Grave, and our subscribers can read her article for free online at our website, equip.org. If you'd like to read this book review and are not currently a subscriber, please go to equip.org for 3350. You can subscribe to our journal. Now, for the last few episodes, I have mentioned a contest to get a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal, or if you win, to give a subscription as a gift to someone else if you already receive it. And that is, we want to get to 100 reviews, either starred or written, at Apple Podcasts by the end of December of this year. That's 2021. So if you have not taken the time to even just quickly give us a starred review, please head over to Apple Podcasts to do that. Even better, how you actually enter into this contest is you need to write a written review because we are going to take all of the name handles there and we are going to randomize those and pick a winner, anyone who's written a review after July 1st of this year. And so it won't matter because I will give you an email address. You don't have to use your real name. You'll have an email address in a later episode after the contest is done and you can connect with us to claim your prize. So we'd like you to help get the word out, tell a friend, link to this podcast on your social media feeds. And if you'd like to help us with a smaller amount than a full subscription, you can tip us. Easily done at equip.org. Go to the drop down under magazine. And if you click onto Postmodern Realities Podcast, any landing page will give you a link where you could give us a small tip, $3, $5, $10, something like that. It helps us to meet our budget and to remunerate writers like Anne and all the ones that you hear on this podcast and continue to bring you this podcast completely free. Thank you for your partnership. We were just talking about the longing that's reflected in the title Book of Longings. And you were talking about Anna, Jesus's wife in this book, her longings. But I did ask you about Jesus, but I know there's other characters. So what about the longings of other people like Jesus and some of the other characters in the book? This is where the book, I would say, doesn't rise to the level of great fiction, because even though it is said that other people have longings, you are not invited to emotionally enter into the longings of anybody else. The main character, I guess, who's sort of a foil to Anna is Tabitha, who's a young girl. They're both young, like 14, and they're both betrothed. And Tabitha is kind of flighty and she likes to sing and dance and she writes her own songs and she and Anna hang out a lot together. And then Tabitha goes off. She's supposed to be married, but instead she's raped and she goes to shout this in the public square that she's been raped and her father is angry and then cuts out her tongue. It's pretty gruesome. (laughs) And So she doesn't obviously get to fulfill her longings 
in that way. And Anna's story intersects with hers at different points. So they obviously lose track of each other. Tabitha is taken away and heals up, but she's basically mute. And then Jesus finds her for Anna at some point. And Tabitha goes to live with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and is given an instrument to play and sort of gets her voice back to one degree or another. So I think she's supposed to be a sort of a contrast to Anna. But really what happens is that you just see as the story progresses that Anna gets whatever she wants very, very easily. There's actually no struggle for her at all. And the technical term I've heard for this is called a Mary Sue. So even Tabitha, who suffers unspeakably, really only makes Anna look good and helps Anna find her longings. Everybody in the story helps Anna find her longings, either accidentally or they try to inhibit her or they, uh, but she just doesn't struggle at all. She easily finds herself over and over and over again in the book. And so I thought it was interesting that Tabitha would have made a much better novel, much better character since she does suffer so much, but she's not the main character. (laughs) And then of course, no, nobody else really has longings that are as important as Anna's. Her aunt, her longings are not as important. Jesus's longings are not that important. Nobody longs for anything that is half as important as what Anna longs for, which is herself. So you just mentioned that she writes poetry, I guess, and she has this incantation bowl. And you also mentioned she worships Sophia. And so since she's not really highlighting, since the author's not really highlighting, Jesus says, God, is he okay with this? It sounds like there's not traditional Christian theology in this book with characters from the Bible. Not at all. So actually Jesus is totally happy for Anna to worship Sophia and worship herself. And as I said, he apologizes at one point for not helping her more fully live into her own longings, which I thought was funny because I've read the Bible over and over again and never once have I in the text of scripture come across God affirming (laughs) any of my longings, especially not for myself. So I thought that was funny and totally unchristian picture of Jesus. Yeah. So Anna becomes a devotee of Sophia basically, but insofar as Sophia works for her, really it's herself that she's seeking. And so Jesus is fine with that. He is not the son of God. He doesn't perform any miracles at all. And He's also not sure. He knows that God has called him to do something. And he talks about God being his father, but he's not really sure what that means until after John the Baptist has been arrested. And then he kind of takes up John the Baptist's mantle and is crucified because Anna's brother Judas betrays him, but not for being God, not for blasphemy or anything like that. So, yeah, there's no Christian doctrine in the book at all. In fact, she goes out of her way to sort of use Christian terminology to subvert it. And some of these were kind of clever. I mentioned them in the article, but at one point Jesus says, oh, you're about to be born again. And that happens after Anna's daughter, Susanna dies. And she's going to double down on finding herself after the death of her child. And that's going to be her rebirth is a, a renewed pursuit of herself. How does Sue Monk Kid view people? In other words, you said, you know, her theology that she's expressing is not biblical in any way. How does she really present, you know, her theology of what women should be like or men should be like? And you said it's more of a modern, there's modern sensibilities in her writing and her expression of her characters. I've been so helped by reading Carl Truman's The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self because he just helps deal with the modern person. And then it's a very new kind of conception of the self. So I've been so helped by Carl Truman's discussion of how the conception of the self has changed. And I really think if you've read Truman's book and then you want 
to see a picture of what he's talking about in a sort of very lively and interesting way, the Book of Longings will show you the person that's described by Carl Truman. And that's somebody who's really good at core, somebody who's deeply good, whose desires are really good and holy, and that the bad things that exist for that person are all societal. They all come from outside and they're cultural. And so in order to become who you're supposed to be, you have to throw away the culture, the familial constraints, the strictures of society that impose on you and keep you from really being who you are. That basic idea is the personhood of Anna. She is wonderful and perfect and glittering and golden. And her only problem is that her family is trying to do her down. They're trying to get her married off. They taught her to write and read, but they don't want her writings. They don't care about what she has to say. And they don't care about her self-expression. And they don't care about what she wants. And so she has to throw that over and embrace herself. And so she's very, it's very individualistic. I think that's interesting is that anybody reading this book from the first century would not recognize Anna as a good person. (laughs) Or, I mean, they just wouldn't know how to talk to her at all because she's such a modern 21st century individual feminist who is able to throw off the patriarchy, which also wouldn't have been possible. (laughs) All the things that she achieves would not have actually been possible for her to achieve at the time that the book is set. What about some like more modern considerations for women? You know, we think of especially the modern feminist movement since the mid 1960s has been very much, well, even before that, but very much focused on family planning, contraception, and birth control. So does Sue Kid have her character deal with those kinds of issues? Because basically, you know, when women got married in those times when Jesus walked the earth, it was, you know, you were a housewife and you had a lot of children. And so is that some part of it? kind of like the Da Vinci Code searching for the long lost child of Jesus and Mary Magdalene is are there children in here that Jesus and Anna have. This is something that really fascinated me because yes, when Anna gets married to Jesus, her aunt Yaltha gives her some kind of herbs that she then takes through the book and avoids pregnancy with Jesus. So they have, of course, a great sex life, which I felt, as a Christian felt sort of blasphemous, but I just try to, you know, bookend that and go with the story. And so she manages to avoid pregnancy with Jesus. And it's a little bit unclear. It seems like it's just pure contraception, but I think I've read a little bit about the herb that she mentions, and I think it could be abortive. And I wonder if Monk was sort of alluding to that part of, you know, that it could work that way. So she avoids pregnancy, and that's very important for her because if she were to have a child, she would not be able to pursue her longings, and she wouldn't be able to write and read and be who she really is if she were to have a child. And so she's going to make this very brave choice to avoid pregnancy. And at first she doesn't tell Jesus, but then after a while he's wondering why they're not having children, and so she tells him And then after they've been married for quite a while, like six or seven years, she does get pregnant. It says the herbs failed her. And she has a baby named Susanna who dies a few days shortly after birth. And that felt very convenient that the child would die. Of course, the child would die, even though she's very sad. Anna is, of course, deeply grieved by the loss of her child, but given the chance to think about having another child, she and Jesus realize that it's really more important for her not to have children because then that will inhibit her from finding her true longing for herself. And I thought that was really interesting because here's a a woman 
who's writing, I think, about the longings of the age. And it's really interesting, I think, for thousands and thousands of years, women have longed to have children. If you read the Bible, the absence of children, the longing for children is so strong and it's such a blessing to have children and women who can't have children are you know imagine themselves to be cursed they are deeply grieved in fact god moves the story of salvation forward by the miraculous birth of children over and over again including and finally the son of god so it's interesting that that's a radical shift away from what most women through human history have longed for to be upfront and bold that actually what a woman longs for is not to have children and that children are an inhibition and a problem is a really, really big and interesting cultural shift to see in the book. Now in this book, Anna is introduced to this kind of like religious order of Jewish, like contemplative philosophers called the therapeutae. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So what about this order of philosophers, the therapeutae? What are they? Is that part of her journey to Sophia worship or something else? It was an actual community that did exist. And she attributes a hymn to Sophia. She puts that in the mouth of Anna. It's a hymn, apparently, that really does exist. And she has Anna write and sing this hymn for the therapeutic towards the end of the book. And yeah, apparently the historical hymn, it does exist somewhere. And this order also exists. It was a men and women and it wasn't hierarchical. They did have like the younger members would do all the work, the physical work and the older members would mostly study. And Anna, of course, in true Mary Sue fashion, comes into this as a young person and is immediately elevated to take care of the library and to be a scribe. And and then that's the way that she preserves her writings. She puts them into a codex. She copies everything several times, binds them, and then puts some of them, buries some of them in the ground. And that's kind of the culmination of her life and her work and her longing is to have written books, written about women in particular, and then done this hymn to Sophia. And so I think that Monk researched that part pretty carefully. And the description of the life there, I think, was probably pretty true to form. So as far as, you know, getting this book out there and having well-known endorsers in terms of, you know, letting people, specifically women, know about this book, who endorsed the Book of Longings and why is it really, you know, hitting a chord? Like I said, people have described it as just, you know, page turning, gripping. Well, the most famous endorser is Glennon Doyle and she loved it. She thought it was her. I, I think she said in other places that it was, you know, wonderful. She loved it so much. And of course, Time Magazine, Washington Post, Christian Science Monitor, Good Housekeeping, Real Simple, pop sugar. Those were the endorsements. So she's mostly got big, big names. I loved Glennon Doyle says, I kept having to close this novel and breathe deeply again and again, a radical reimagining of the New Testament that reflects on women's longing and silence and awakening. It is a true masterpiece. So I think that's a little bit disingenuous. It's not a reimagining of the New Testament. It's a fictional story that tangentially uses the name of Jesus, but it has nothing to do with the New Testament. So if Glennon Doyle thinks that this is related to the Bible, then she needs to go back and read it again. But yeah, she really loved the book. And I feel like this is a fictional account of her life, really. If you read Untamed, she and Anna are kind of the same person. So I guess the big question is, should Christians read this book? Obviously, you have to read it for this review, but should Christians stay away from this book, especially, you know, if they have a group of friends that everyone's reading this book, should they say, okay, well, I want to see what it's about? Well, I guess I think the way that you approach any book is important. So I do think that some Christians should absolutely not read this book because they don't know the Bible well enough. They don't have a deeply Christian conception of the human person and what is good and what is bad and what God wants. 
and who God is. And so because she uses Jesus as a character, I think many people who profess to be Christian read the Da Vinci Code and thought that it was real (laughs) or got their view of history from the Da Vinci Code. And that was, you know, that was too bad because it's not. So I don't think the Christians who are not grounded, they should read this book. They shouldn't bother with it. They should actually just go read the Bible because the narrative arc of scripture is better and more interesting than this book. I do think that if you are really grounded and you do know a lot of people who are reading this book, then I would suggest that a Christian read it mainly so that because you get an emotional picture of what people think about themselves and what they think is good and bad. And I do think it would give, in an apologetic sense, a Christian the furniture maybe to talk to somebody who doesn't know God at all and doesn't know that, you know, the human heart is wicked and needs to be saved, that society isn't really to blame. It's our inclinations that are wicked, and so that's why we do bad things. I would actually read The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self and then read this book for a really full picture of what this world right now thinks is good and true. And then I think you would be equipped then to go and talk to people about who they are and who God is in a warm way, I think, you know, rather than like, you're just terrible and everything you want is bad. (laughs) But sort of open the conversation like, you know, wow, we do have longings for things. What are those longings? And if you really found yourself, what would that be like? And would that really be good? And can you even do that? I think it's really interesting to me that Anna in the Book of Longings is a Mary Sue. She is perfect. She's like a dream wish on the part of the author. And she doesn't have any trials And I think that most people think that when they really pursue themselves, they will end up being like Anna and that it'll be like that. They'll have a really golden and beautiful life. Whereas I would say that when you really do pursue yourself and you adore yourself and you worship yourself, you don't end up like Anna. You don't end up with a book of scrolls that you wrote by yourself. You end up isolated and without really good, strong human relationships. And you end up as a very flat person, which is how Anna is. She's actually flat. She's not golden. She's not interesting. She's pretty boring as a character. And that's what will happen to you if you pursue your own longings. So earlier in this podcast, you thought that this book doesn't really rise to the level of classic, great literary fiction. And so besides the characters not being as fully realized as, like you just said, they're flat, why else would you think that this is not in the category of literary fiction like War and Peace or something of that nature? And where does it fall in fiction in general? Where would you put it? I think it doesn't rise. I mean, I don't think you could call it really true historical fiction because it doesn't let you enter the world of that time period. I think you, in a hundred years, you could consider it to be historical fiction. If you wanted to understand what 2021 was like, you could read it, you know, backwards that way. But if you want to understand what the first century was like, this book does not give you a picture of what life would have been like. It doesn't help you enter into the lives of people who are very unlike us, who have a different view of what is good and what is bad and who God is and who the person is, which is why, you know, if I'm going to read a book, I really, I really want to enter into the world of the characters and the time period if it's historical fiction. And so she does not do that at all. She just writes the book that people want now. And then it doesn't rise to the level of great literature because she, There's no narrative arc, really. Anna starts out being a certain kind of person, and she carries on being that person throughout. She never changes as a person at all. She never undergoes any trial that affects her actual character, and her longings never change. 
I think really good books, the main character thinks they want something in the beginning. And then as the narrative progresses, they discover that they want or need something else or that they need to change or they are the wrong kind of person. And that's what makes a good book, a good novel is the internal change of the main character. And I think as a person who, as I said, I've read the Bible over and over again, the Bible is an amazing, it's not fiction, but it has a fantastic arc and it shows it, it's a really good, it, all stories to one degree or another should be modeled on the way that scripture progresses from the down into the depths, basically, and then back up. And God goes with us through that change of the human person. And even Jesus doesn't come out unscathed. In Hebrews, it says that he's made perfect in suffering. He was perfect, but even he gained something by becoming human and going to the cross that he wouldn't have had had he not done it. So I do think, I mean, I wonder if people are not reading great books, they will think that this is a great book uh, because it's fun, but it's not a great book. And so, you know, you're just talking about arcs in literature and that same could be said for film or television or something like that, where you have a sense of redemption that takes place in a character that's significant. And, you know, when you said she's kind of a Mary Sue, is there really any sense of grand redemption in the story? I mean, that's true of stories written by non-religious people too. Is there anything at all that would have the reader look and say, well, this character did go through some kind of grand redemption. No, there's no redemption at all for anyone. And no one needs it. I think that's the first problem. No one needs to be redeemed. The bad characters are just irredeemably bad and none of them turn out to be good. And Anna is good, so she doesn't need anything really no, there's no redemption. It's sort of tragic. And I think it's also, you know, if that is your view of the human person, that you just need to find yourself, you don't need to be redeemed. Well, the problem is you're not going to be an interesting character for other people to know. <laughs> and it's going to be so boring for you. You should live a life, even if it's sort of, if you wanted to live a fictional life, you should live a life of being changed from one kind of thing into another kind of thing instead of just being the same forever. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have a couple of fun rapid fire questions for Anne. So it's summer, the pool, the beach, or the lake? Well, I would love to go to the beach, but this year we're going to go up to Lake Ontario for two weeks and camp and see if we can go swimming without getting too cold. So this book, is probably not ranked as something you'd recommend, it sounds like, even just from a literary point of view. So what is one of your favorite novels that you could recommend to our readers to read instead of this book? I'm actually reading right now Rebecca West's The Fountain Overflows. And similarly, it's an autobiographical kind of novel. And all of the characters are terrible people. <laughs> but it's so beautifully written and it's the best book about music that I know of that describes music and what music is like. And there's an enormous amount of tension in the book and pain. It's a beautiful book. If you're looking for a good summer read, read that one. Well, thanks, Anne, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. You've been listening to episode 245 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Anne Kennedy, who's written an online, in-depth summary critique book review called Glimpsing the Grave, a critical review of the Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd. And our subscribers can read her review for free online at our website, equip.org. If you would like to read her book review and are not currently subscribers, head on over to equip.org to subscribe to our journal. Thank you. We'd like to connect to you, so please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel and join in the conversation in the comment section and in the live chat when we have premiere videos. Please follow the Bible Answer Man page on Facebook and on Twitter. You will find us at Hank Hanegraaff. Bible Answer Man, Christian Research Institute, and Christian Research Journal, as well as on Instagram at the Bible Answer Man account. 
You won't want to miss every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern when we live stream the Bible Answer Man broadcast, hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff at our website, equip.org. In addition, please subscribe to the Hank Unplugged podcast. Hank gets out of the studio and into his study and engages in in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. You'll want to head on over to Equip.org because there you're going to find thousands of free resources for you in articles and past broadcasts, our podcasts, and videos. And thank you for all the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. Mm-hmm.